Thank you. Well, good morning, church. Uh, please rise as you're, as you're able and join me in the songs of preparation. And in the spirit of thanksgiving, let's give thanks with a grateful heart.
community, we are gathered here this morning to indeed know that we are not only in a house of God, a community of faith, but to be here and to be grateful. To be grateful for all of the blessings that we have received and that we shall continue to receive today and throughout the week. And so I ask that we open our hearts, we open our minds, and allow the presence of God to continue to fill us to hold us, to comfort us, to celebrate with us as we gather here this morning for worship. I ask this in all the names that are holy. Amen and amen. Please be seated. And welcome to everyone this morning. I am Reverend Dr. Pat Langless, Provisional Interim Pastor here at MCC, UCC Church in the Valley, and it is a great day to be here. Amen? It is a great day to be here in community with one another and to just enjoy the blessings. This is a week of blessings. We're reminded of that left and right, and, and I just, I'm just going to invite us to be open to that, to whether it's right now in worship or throughout the week, just to allow ourselves to receive the blessings that are ours. And I'd like to welcome those of you who are a guest with us for the first time today. If you wouldn't mind just raising your hand so we can acknowledge you and, and bring to you a, well, right over here, we, the, 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 our usher, oh, you already got it, great, okay. Um, and then for you as well as everyone at worship, at uh, offering time, uh, especially if you're a guest, if you could fill this out and put it in the offering basket. Uh, so we can uh, be, stay in touch with you. We would greatly appreciate that. If you uh, have been here before and have updates to anything, please also utilize this and let us know. We also uh, absolutely believe in the power of prayer. We have a prayer card uh, that is also included at any time throughout worship. Uh, please feel free to fill this out and to put it in the offering plate again as it comes around so that we can uh, lift your prayers up. If it is a confidential prayer and you do not want it shared aloud, please circle yes, it is confidential, and we will not share it. Otherwise, we will uh, lift it up uh, and you in a verbal prayer at communion. We also, uh, you will also have received your bulletin, and it has, of course, not only our order of wor worship, uh, but good information of announcements on the back. Uh, one of the announcements that isn't there is a, a great gratitude for those who have been here the last couple nights for uh, the movie night on Friday, for the uh, a fundraiser concert last night uh, for Trans Lifeline. They were able to raise a fair amount of money uh, for the crisis line. It's a crisis line for uh, transgender folks. And uh, Lucas Sang, as well as uh, another other others here. So a uh, huge thank you for everyone who is a part of that. I do want to let folks know, if, uh, to call your attention to some of the things that are in the black box on there, is that we are going to be having a second offering today. The second offering is going to be for a Puerto Rico relief fund. As you know, we're raising funds uh, for a water filtration system uh, for a rural area within Puerto Rico. Uh, as well as to uh, help folks who are, uh, uh, were clients, are clients of a domestic violence shelter, who's of course their shelter, as along with everyone else's homes, is no longer in existence. And so uh, we're also helping that organization as well. So please uh, give as you're able for that. If you uh, were not prepared to uh, put an offering for that today, we do have a link for that in our newsletter. Uh, you can, if you, received it. If you didn't, let me know, and we'll get you a copy of the newsletter, online newsletter. There's a link to that where you can also donate online, okay? So spread the news to your friends, and uh, we can continue to help those in need. Immediately following service, we do have our congregational uh, meeting. Uh, so afterwards, <coughs> go get your coffee and snack and come back in uh, about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our meeting. It's very exciting. We have some uh, folks who are running for the board. We have our um, 
the reports, our budget, and all that good fun stuff. So please make, take the time to stick around. And you don't have to be a member to attend, but only a mem uh, members can vote, but everyone can attend. And what's happening this week? Thanksgiving. And in a moment, I'm going to invite Lane up. He's going to share with us about a Thanksgiving here. But I do want to let you know that the Interfaith Food Pantry of, uh, of the Valley is going to be hosting an interfaith worship service. It is happening Wednesday night, Church of the Chimes. The information is on here. It's at 730. Uh, I, I'm going to be involved in it as well as others, and so I'm going to invite us to, to come and be there uh, to show that, yes, we care and that we want to be in fellowship uh, with others. So please, uh, if you have the, the time, 730 Wednesday night, and join us there. I'm going to invite Lane forward for our two exciting uh, uh, Thanksgiving. Very exciting. Very, it is. It will be. It was so exciting, I blanked for a moment. <laughs> so, this is a Thanksgiving sign-up sheet. Okay, kids? Kind of last minute. Um, I just ran it out last night. So, please, um, we're supplying the, I'm going to roast a couple of birds and big old vat of mashed potatoes and gallons of gravy. So, if you would just sign up to a side, you know, for a side dish to and that includes like cups and plates if you want to, you know, cop out and do that. <laughs> no, if it's easier for you just to bring utensils and cups and plates, that would be great too. So uh, it just gives me an idea of what is going to be provided and, you know, what you need to fill in as far as, you know, holes. And then, um, so we'll, I'll have this out in the hospitality room so you can sign up afterwards. Um, and then this is very last minute, but we used to do this uh, quite a bit, have a little bonfire out <coughs> in the uh, out in the garden area once or twice a year. So I thought maybe Friday night, if y'all are not doing anything, and maybe after you're shopping or whatever, you want to come over to the church, I'll have some hot cider, uh, probably some cookies or something, and um, we'll have a little bonfire out back, and we can just sit and fellowship and you know stuff like that. Start kick off the holiday season. Okay. Yay. So, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That will be fun. He says, uh, seven o'clock uh, going to so be seven, a... seven, yeah, seven. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> he goes, are people going to be done shopping? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always Cyber Monday. Right. <laughs> so be here. And we're also, the only other thing is on Thanksgiving, we will follow our, uh, it's going to be uh, from noon to four, really kind of 1230-ish. Uh, but we'll just say noon to four so people show up on time. And then uh, as the eating winds down, we're going to be having a, a movie, uh, Undercover Blues. Um, so that will be, be shown. Yeah. Is this Wednesday or Thursday? Thursday. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Day is the, is the, um, feast. the feast, yeah. which everyone's invited. You can invite your friends. It's simply for those who would like to come together and have, uh, have some time with each other. Uh, and then go off to other obligations if you have to, or vice versa. Um, so that's Thursday, thank you. And Friday is the bonfire, so which will be kind of fun too. So that's about it for now, except the really fun part, which is to uh, turn and greet each other. And before you do, we're going to end uh, our, uh, our greeting time with getting in a circle to sing, um, Let There Be Peace on Earth and then um, going to our seats. So we, uh, the, the team had thought, let's try that. So let's turn to each other and greet each other together.
pa, I stay short. I stay being short. Just everything. Alrighty. Um, our readings today are taken from the book. Oh yeah, you write. Is that is that better? <laughs> All right. Our our readings today are taken from the book of Acts, chapter eight, verses twenty nine through forty, from the New Revised Standard Version. Listen to what the Spirit has for you today. Then an angel of God said to Philip, "Get up and go go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road." So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace queen of the Ethiop Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seating in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join him. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? <clears throat> Excuse me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth, and his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of God snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he went passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This ends our reading. May God open up these words to our hearts and to our minds. time I thought there's only me crazy in a way that no one else could be I'd have given everything I own if someone would have said you're not alone All the time I thought that I was wrong, wanting to be me, but needing to belong. If I'd have just appreciated all I had, if someone would have said, you're not so bad. All the time, all the wasted time, all the years waiting for a sign to think I had it all, all the time. time I thought there's only me crazy in a way that no one else could be I can't believe that you were somewhere too thinking all the time there's only you all the time 
all the wasted time, all the years waiting for a sign to think I had it all. All the time. the little contraption that Pat uses, except I can't hold my tablet in my left hand. <laughs> it would be inconvenient. <sighs> I chose that song because it carries at least for me, a vast amount of significance, and it uh, probably does for most people who are trans, um, and I'm sure an equal number of people who are gay and lesbian. Um, and of course, Barry Manilow is gay, so go figure. Uh, <laughs> for the better part of the 20th century, and now well into the 25th century, people who claim a really strong fundamentalist religion have been holding up their Bibles and all of their righteous indignation and crying out that transgenders are evil, filled with sin, abominations, spawn of Satan, able to destroy civilization as we know it, um, or worse. Of course, I've responded on Facebook occasionally, if we had that much power, we would have been controlling this world centuries ago. <laughs> yes. Turn the whole gay, the whole world gay. Um, and of course, they claim the Bible is their source of inspiration. But where's their evidence? What scriptural evidence do they possess that gives them the pious superiority against people who are trans? Well, they use one single passage, and that's in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 22.5. And it's noteworthy to take a look at Deuteronomy 22 to put this kind of into perspective. Now, Leviticus and Deuteronomy is kind of strange in a way that it is grouped into themes. How to do this, how to do that, and different ways of putting this together. They the early writers of those two books did this, of course, so simpler minds could figure out what the heck was going on. But when you look at Deuteronomy 22, verse 1 through 4 basically deals with how you should treat your neighbor's ox, sheep, donkey. Falls in a ditch, you help get it out, so forth and so on. 6 and 7 relates to birds and their nests and how you should take care of things like you can eat the eggs but put the nest back up, leave the mother bird alone so they can make more eggs so that you can knock it out of the nest and have more eggs later. <laughs> Don't kill the bird. Verse 8 relates to things around your house, putting up parapets, things like that, so people don't fall off the roof. Verse 9 about planting or not planting other crops with your vineyard, you know, you don't you know, nice crop of grapes and corn, same time. <laughs> and 10 deals with, of course, other ways how you should be treating your ox and your donkey and don't put them together to plow your field. Five doesn't fit, okay? It just doesn't, it doesn't belong there. Um, and of course, 11 and 12, of course, deals with your uh, clothing. You know, don't wear mixed fabrics. You know, don't wear cotton and leather. <laughs> you abomination. Um, you know, woolen and linen suits for all of you gentlemen out there. Um, 
And of course, how many tassels you should have on the bottom of your, your, your Jewish thingy. Okay. So five doesn't fit. Now what does five talk about? Well, first of all, it basically addresses the fact that a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Oh God, you're in trouble. Um, <laughs> you all are. <laughs> I'm the only one that's okay. Um, and kind of as an afterthought, it's a man should not wear that which pertaineth to a woman. Why? Why did they stick this in there? What does it mean? Well, I've, I've spoken to a lot of Jewish scholars about this because it really doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. And the consensus I've had back from many of them is it was so that women did not disguise themselves as boys to sneak in to learn the Talmud, to get an education. It was to keep the girls dumb. Okay. Kind of an afterthought is then said, okay, guys, don't dress up like women to sneak into the harems to get laid. But it makes no sense. It's just, you know, by the way, back then, you know, a burnoose is a burnoose is a burnoose. You know, what's the difference between men and women's clothing? It's basically jewelry. Okay. Now, in Deuteronomy, like I said, it's all grouped into these basic themes across the board. But scripture has been so misconstrued in all of this. But this is the only passage they really have to play with. Now, they have tried, of course, going into um, Corinthians and finding that passage that, you know, has been mistranslated by King James, who was gay, about not being effeminate. But they mistranslated the word because the word that they're translating from is malakos, which means soft. If you go back into actual Greek literature, it means soft. Person of soft living, you know, like Trump. <laughs> and I'll leave that one right where it is. Now, on the other side of the Bible, I guess, is there is, of course, you know, how we look at transgenders. What, what, is, what is a transgender? Well, in, in biblical terms, in the ancient Hebrew, basically eunuch is the old Bible term for someone who's trans. It is someone who lives outside of their birth gender. Now, if you look at Matthew, if you look at Jeremiah, you look at Esther, you look at um, Isaiah, trans people are elevated. We're the, the keepers of the keys. We're the ones who manage and protect the harems. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're the, the treasurers. As the Ethiopian eunuch, he is the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. These are lofty positions of respect and honor. And, you know, even God's telling Isaiah, you know, elevate these people they're they're great even though they're maybe a dry dry twig or dry tree they're still children of god and now even jesus in matthew says that there are people that are born this way there are people who are made this way by the hand of another and there are people that are this way in the service of god and many people think that jesus is actually referring to himself in the third category so he's one of us but there's no condemnation anywhere in scripture about being trans, nowhere. Now, that brings us, of course, to the reading. For obvious reasons, it is a favorite. It's not just about because it involves the Ethiopian transgender, as I like to rephrase it, but his station that he holds their interest in scripture, especially Isaiah, which also proves many positive passages about transgenders, and the fact that this person wants to be baptized. Now, if you also look at, at this part in Acts, there are two important baptisms. 
The first one on record is, thank God for all favors, the Ethiopian transgender. First non-Jew, Gentile, who's baptized into being a Christian. He's not circumcised first, which probably would have been problematic. <laughs> and, but it's, and not only is he trans, but he's African. He isn't even brown, <laughs> let alone white. And man of, of, of high station. Now the second, of course, comes a little bit later, and that's when the apostle um, Peter, got to go through all of them. Peter baptizes the Roman Cornelius and his whole family, but he's the second, not the first. So if, if, we, you know, if we're elevated that far up and we're in, still in the Bible, we must be really special people. So, if we're so evil, such as this abomination to God, that will destroy the very fabric of civilization, which is ridiculous to think that someone who is trans would actually destroy fabric. <laughs> <laughs> we'll transform it, but we won't destroy it. Why are we singled out in such a positive light? in the very Bible that fundamentalists are trying to use to condemn us. Why would Acts 8 even be allowed to have remained in the Bible since 325 if transgenders are so wrong? Now, the truth of the matter is, normal society is scared to death of us. Okay. They fear us, and they try to use scripture to give them a reason to fear, because otherwise their fear is completely unfounded. Because we challenge their little boxes of security. We challenge their notion of binary. We don't fit into their little myopic world. We raise questions that they fear to ask, because they fear the answers within themselves. Now, our patron saint, Joan of Arc, was burned at the stake not because of any sins against the church. In fact, her voices were declared valid and real from both sides, both the English and the French, or the Burgundians, but because she refused to accept her subservient place in life as a submissive male, a female. Basically, she looked at the world around her and says, heck with that. I could have used a different word, but I won't. Um, she challenged the male dominance as an equal in society. She refused to wear men's clothes, she wore armor, and they burned her at the stake. In fact, many women who break from these little boxes and have achieved great power in history are despised and ridiculed by historians and belittled and debased. Needless to say, it's almost always been from men who write the history, until recently. Now we're starting to do our own. The inverse is equally frightening for the male dominant society. Any male who rejects, for whatever reason, his role as the superior and dominant member of his societal hierarchy is now considered a traitor to his sex, gender, and class, and therefore should be shunned and feared as becoming less of a man. I look at it as being more of a person. Men cannot readily conceive of any male who would voluntarily reject that position of power. And therefore, that male must be a great sinner and in legal evil forces bent upon the degradation and destruction of all mankind. Well, we are, but <laughs> that's our little secret. So, what about November 20th, tomorrow? Transgender Day of Remembrance is now observed on November 20th to honor a trans woman named Rita Hester, whose senseless and brutal murder in 1988 so affected the trans community 
that the Remembering Our Dead project was created happened up in San Francisco. The following year, in 1989, the city of San Francisco held a candlelight march and vigil honoring transgender individuals have been murdered because of transphobia. This remembrance is now also celebrated in cities around the world. We count our dead and we honor them. But it's not just those who have died at the hands of others. And even that is barbaric enough as it is. So many trans women in particular are not just killed, but they are mutilated. The man they may be with finds out that she's trans, post-op or pre-op. And suddenly, it is a need to eradicate that person from existence. They don't just kill. They cut off their faces or blow them off with the guns. They burn the bodies. If they're pre-op, they're mutilated in that way. Then there's the ones who feel, as the song says, all alone feeling different, feeling strange, who never find love, never find companionship because of the way our society is rigged, and in their loneliness and despair commit suicide. <clears throat> Trans women in particular have the highest rate of suicide of any subculture in the world. And a lot of that is because society has treated us like fourth class citizens. I'm going to tell you a little story. The story really doesn't have a happy ending yet. doesn't really have an ending yet. But it can be retold countless times by countless people in countless places with a variety of variations. There's a young child, a child who seems just like any other child to the outside world. Let's say it's a young boy. But a child who's growing up with a secret. The secret is so frightening, the child keeps it locked away in a dark place, a hidden place, but a place where, like yeast in a warm bowl, ferments and grows. The growth is slow at first, but it builds in time, creating pressure that eventually seeks an exit, a release. Ages vary. With some as young as three or four, others in their teens or even older. But that realization eventually comes to light that's inside, and their brain and their spirit tells them they're not boys, they're not men, but they're girls or women. Their bodies betray them, though. What they see in the mirror is not what their mind and their heart says is the truth, but society demands something else. Society says, you look like this, so this is what you are. This is how you must behave. This is how you must dress. But it doesn't work, at least not for very long. For some, it explodes out, and the young child, maybe in their teens, rejects what society demands and starts expressing themselves from their inner sense onto the outside. Shocked family rejects them, disowns them, casts them out. In order to survive, to just put a roof over their head and food on their table, many turn to the only work society will grant them, prostitution. Nowhere else can they get a job that will support them. Society itself has rejected them, but only uses them. And unfortunately, so have so many religions through the years. Or the child remains hidden, terrified, afraid, and alone. They try their best to fit in. They adopt masculine or feminine behaviors. They mimic. They force, are forced by society to seem like one of the boys or one of the girls. Behind closed doors, in a shadow world, they live out their real life, but only in a dream. 
They dress in secret, sharing with nobody, and yet burning with the need to share with everybody. But what people don't see is the real person, the person in pain, crying out for somebody to share their life with. They might find somebody, also in secret, making connections on the side and hiding, secret getaways to resorts or gatherings. But while this helps, it's never enough. Society still looks upon his or her kind, like a pervert, a child molester. This is society's image, the brand placed upon the transgender. They are terrified that disclosure will mean the loss of everything. They fear family will reject them. They will lose their jobs, their homes, their friends, everything. So the hiding continues and the depression sets in. The depression can be insidious, dark and deep, with no lifeline. In the end, they're left with nothing but darkness, despair, rejection, and pain. In the end, a large number of these people, otherwise productive and loving and caring and giving individuals, will then take their own lives. I've unfortunately known many who have. They die because society and religions have killed them. Just as assuredly as if they held the gun or gave them the pills. They died because society feared them in ignorance and indifference. And often as not, these people still die in secret. Their real selves left unnoticed. They die unknown. I can relate to most of this story because I kept my secret inside me for a long, long time. It kept bubbling out, but always, always in private, always in the shadows. I tried to reconcile myself with my first marriage, which ended pretty much disastrously. And with the ending of my first marriage, I also lost all of my relatives because in their piousness, and their indifference, they sided with my ex and treated me like I was a ghost. And the pain that caused was deep. Now we're coming into the holiday seasons now. Thanksgiving is upon us, Christmas is not very far away. Imagine being in pain, having had your family ripped apart, and you go to Christmas time, hoping for love hoping for some acknowledgement of your pain and being treated like nothing more than a wisp of smoke. Having your relatives ignore you like you're not even there. That was my Christmas of 1982. I set upon a course to rebuild my life, come to terms with myself, and say to the rest of the world, to heck with you. I was no longer going to hide. I was always afraid of losing everything. Well, I'd lost everything. And I spent 18 months finding myself, and then I found my wife. I wasn't going to make the same mistake twice. I told her about me when we first started dating. If I was going to lose a relationship, I wasn't going to get too far and do it. <coughs> And lo and behold, I found out she already knew <laughs> from a mutual friend. And she says, well, if you want to get dressed up nice as a woman, we can go out sometime. My jaw hit the ground. As soon as I picked it up, I thought to myself, okay, she's a keeper. And she has been for 33 years. It helped me rebuild my family. Not blood relatives, mind you. It helped me rebuild family the way family is. Family of love, family of the heart. Friends who recognize me and accept me for who I am as a person, not as a thing. They know that I'm not a pervert. Amen. Keep that secret well hidden. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> it's 
been 10 years as a teacher, never laid a hand on any of them. Um, but I've got people in my life who love me more than my relatives ever did. And that's what being genuine is all about. That's what being is all about. That's what Christianity is all about. That's what real faith is all about in Christ and in God. So, who and what are transgenders? Well, most of the public at large either have a misconception about us or are completely ignorant on the subject altogether. I've done my best to educate this congregation or our older elements of our congregation over the years. This is not a choice we make. God knows it's not a choice. No one wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I want to start wearing dresses in public and suffer all the rage of ignorance and hostility in the world. <laughs> no one's that stupid. We're hardwired at birth or even before. We feel in our minds and hearts that we are not of our physical gender or sex, but the other. We identify with everything of the opposite sex and opposite gender. This is not a choice. Now, I do use trans women here as a prime example only because women already have, or women who become men, and even women, have the ability to already dress masculine if they choose a certain level of acceptance, and no one seems to care. Granted, it has been a hard battle for women to be able to accomplish this, considering not much more than 100 years ago, if you ran around in pants, you were in deep trouble. I mean, if you were missing your corset and your bustle and your long dresses and everything else, you know, you were, not to mention not being able to vote, being still considered property by your male relatives and everything else. But it is how we think relative to the world, to visualize ourselves and interact socially, being trans. It also has nothing to do directly with sexual preferences, which can, of course, make life a bit more complicated on the outside. A lot of people that meet Leslie and I for the first time probably think we're a lesbian couple. I'm not going to tell them different. That's their problem. But all we want, all we crave, are the simple things. Justice, respect as a human being, and the freedom to be who we are and as God created us. We're not mistakes. We are God's children, no more and no less than anybody else. And as such, we deserve the same rights, respect and opportunities, and freedom. We deserve to be allowed to let our spirits soar, to rise up and to live free, and to live without fear. Today, as more of us are coming out, we are the spirit of that Ethiopian eunuch, that first convert, first convert to the Christian faith. And as a transgender to boot, yes. And like that Ethiopian, we are all children of God and deserve nothing less. Never forget it. Thank you. You know, we, have a, we all have a calling on our lives. God is calling each and every one of us from wherever we are, whoever we are. And you're in the right place. And all we have to do is answer and say, Here I am, Lord. By the Lord, the sea and sky, I have heard my Yes. Nice.
we uh, when I hear that song here I am Lord here I am God who do you call send me I, I think of I think of us God is calling all of us no matter who we are and so my prayer is that we go out and we can say to God here I am let me be of service and this church is one of those places that we can say here I am and I can go and serve God so the offering plates are going to come around in just a moment. And, and as they are passed, I invite you to give and to give freely. And, and to, when you do, know that it was because people, generations before us, believed that we should have a place to be just as we are. May we seed that for the future to come. And after the plates go by the first time, they will pass a second time. That second offering will be for Puerto Rico because we need to be here for us and we need to be there for those who are in need in other places. So give freely, give with joy, and may we know <coughs> indeed that we plant the seeds. Indeed, that your hand 
be upon them, and that we might be good stewards of the gifts given so freely and from the heart. I ask blessings in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. We have an opportunity to share our prayers written upon paper and written upon our hearts. And I shall share a few, and then Reverend Megan. We have prayers for Rich, who needs a touch from God, who is under a spiritual attack, and for all of us who are feeling the same. And a prayer from John Park, a prayer for my mom, this Wednesday marks two years since her passing. And I would add to pray for you as well, my friend, as you remember and celebrate her life. This last Tuesday, two dear friends of mine, Philip and Diane Hedden, lost their daughter, mm -hmm. Gwenna Siobhan Hedden. Mm -hmm. It's a special case with Gwena. And I told Phil that I would be lifting her memory up at church this Sunday. Gwena always was afraid that she would be forgotten. She only lived 21 years. But in those 21 years, she beat almost all the odds. She was born with cystic fibrosis. Generally, someone born with that disease doesn't make it out of their first 10 years. She made 21. Mm -hmm. She might have lived longer, but Phil and Diane, Gwena, lived in Corona. And the canyon fire, not too long ago, off the 91 freeway, affected Gwena very badly. They got her to UCLA, where she was on the top of the list for a lung transplant that she'd been waiting for for a long time. It didn't come in time. She died on Tuesday. I want to remember her and Phil and Diane for the sacrifice they gave to their daughter, for the fight that she gave and the life she lived, as short as it was. Mm -hmm. I also want to lift up, as this week is to remind us this is Transgender Remembrance Week. There are more dead than there are days in the year. As I said, most of the ones that are chronicalized are murdered. These are not just in the United States, but around the world. There are some cultures in our world that treat people like myself with the utmost of contempt and deserve to die. There are even some in our own country in political <clears throat> office or running for political office that would just as soon people like myself be exterminated with the same zealousness that the Jews were disposed of in Europe in the 1940s. That is a frightening realization even in America. Raise up all of those who have died. If you want their names and their numbers, feel free to go out to tdor.info. <coughs> it will list all of them and their stories online. I encourage you to do so. And when you do, think of those trans people in your life that you do know, including myself the struggles that we endure just to live a normal life. Amen. Amen. God, we thank you for hearing us in every situation of life, but for we all play each of these roles sooner or later. Help us to support one another, rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. 
for we want to be joined together as members of the body of Christ in unity, loving one another and serving the world. We want, like Jesus, to respond to each human being who crosses our path with sensitivity and compassion. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen. to give you praise and thanks for all of the wonders of creation. We marvel at the beauty and complexity of the universe, from the burning heat of the stars to our world's oceans to the smallest of creatures. You, O oh God, sustain all life, all life, no matter who we are, and cherish its diversity. You are faithful beyond our imagination and your love is everlasting. We thank you, God, for you still invite people to share your life, and so with hearts full of love, we join together to sing your praise. it was on a meal that Jesus called his followers together and there were the 12 and more. It was the meal of liberation. We know it today as the Passover. And there's a, in that meal is what we celebrate every time we gather on Sundays when we celebrate communion. And there's something important especially I'd like to remind us of today that when Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and he shared it with those who were there, he said, here, take this, for this is my body, broken for you. Minds and hearts and bodies can be broken, and his was about to be. But he also said, I ask you, I put it out to you, to share this meal and to share it often, and when you do so, read. Remember me, bringing the body into wholeness. The close in the meal, Jesus then lifted up his cup. And he told those with him that this cup symbolize the blood that would be shed from him for all of us. It wasn't just the people in the room. It wasn't just the people in Jerusalem. It wasn't just for the Jews. His blood was being spilled in the redemption of sin for all of humanity. Whether they had heard the word of Jesus or not, whether they lived in that part of the Middle East or in a mountaintop in the Andes, or in some jungle in Borneo. It didn't matter. This 
salvation was for all of humankind, for all time. Mm -hmm. Gay, straight, trans, white, black, yellow, red, brown, male, female, or all of us in between. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Mm -hmm. And he said that when you drink of it. Remember me. Mm -hmm. Renew in us the spirit of the early church. Early church. Where the spirit empowered and emboldened the followers of Jesus to preach forgiveness and to heal division, not create it. Where the spirit stirred dreams of peace, freedom, and justice love. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> now, let us sing the prayer that Jesus taught us. Friends, this is a time for us to come forward and to receive a meal of transformation, of healing, and of resurrection. So as the ushers guide us in a moment to the stations in front, there will be acolytes who will be holding the plates and cups that you can take the elements, dip, and receive, and then if you would like one of the servers to pray with you or for you, we will be there to do that. If you would like at any time during the service to receive the elements just between you and your creator, there will be a station to your left to which you might go at any time. But friends, this is a time when all of us are welcome to this table. You need not be a member of this church or of any church, follow a faith. All we ask is that you are seeking and I hope praying for healing of heart and mind and soul. We accept you just the way you are because that's what Jesus did. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's keep this feast. Let's follow the ushers as we break bread with one another.
Friends, we save the best for last, if you will. We save this uh, piece of communion because when we receive it, we receive it in honor and in blessing and for all of those who could not be here at this time, especially for all of those who have lost their lives, especially the folks who are trans who didn't quite make it and didn't hear the messages that you are hearing today and the messages that you will continue to share with yourself and with others. May that message be, you are loved fully and completely, just the way you are. So for them, we receive today. Amen and amen. Well, my friends, as we have received message and prayer and song, I ask that we take the opportunity now to rise as we're able to bring our voices together, our hearts together once again for our closing prayer, closing song. I just want to thank you. I just want to praise you forever and ever. I just want to thank you forever and ever. Amen.